Welcome everyone. My name is Scott and I'm one of the pastors at Branch Life Church and I'm so excited to welcome you to my living room. Uh, we didn't know we'd be here but uh, here we are and I'm glad to spend a little bit of time thinking about God's Word with you together. This will probably be our biggest ever house party and we'll also have the least amount of stuff to clean up. So thank you for being part of that and thanks for not making a mess. But uh, it's kind of a crazy time that we're all a part of right now, isn't it? With this COVID-19 virus and being stuck at home and we're sharing this experience with like 3 billion of our closest friends around the world. And it's just a bizarre experience. I'm trying to figure out how to teach my kindergarten son how to use Google Classroom and Zoom meetings, which I didn't think I'd be doing a couple of weeks ago. And my daughter is hosting a birthday party for my dad with her cousin over the internet. Uh, just, it's just strange. Uh, having to, to go and, and stand in, in certain spots at the grocery store so we don't get too close to people in line and, and all of these things that we're experiencing together that we, we thought we never would have to. One of the things that we're also experiencing together is probably a mutual desire for all of us to experience a big miracle. And wouldn't it be great if like tomorrow morning we woke up and this was just all over, it was all gone, that, that somehow it had been taken away. And so we could go and give our neighbors a big hug, we could do something scandalous, and instead of like talking to the plexiglass at Costco, we could give the cashier a high five, and maybe even take like extra samples. Like it would be uh, a, a great time. And, and wouldn't it be great if that happened? Wouldn't it be great if there were a miracle worker and uh, we've been thinking about this idea of proving it about the ministry of Jesus and, and asking ourselves what if he really was who he claimed to be and today we're gonna think about this idea of miracles and did Jesus do miracles and and I'm going to share with you some reasons why I think that it's, it's, it's really good to believe that Jesus did actually do miracles. But, but before we get there, we need to make sure that we're on the same page as uh, what a miracle is. So, like, I think it's a miracle that my wife actually married me and agreed to marry me in the fashion that she did and the way that that happened. And I'll save that story for another time. But, but that's, you know, we could jokingly say it's a miracle that that happened. Uh, it's fantastic, but that's not exactly what we're talking about when we talk about a miracle in the Bible. One noted apologist or, or Christian philosopher defined a miracle in this way. William Lane Craig said, A miracle is an event in which the natural causes at a time or place cannot produce that event at that time and place. So what we're talking about, and to, to kind of work through that, that definition just a little bit more, is let's think about one of Jesus' miracles. Let's think about a time when he and then Peter joined him in walking on the water. Okay, it didn't work out quite as well for Peter, but for a little bit there, they were both walking on the water. Now, what this definition is saying is that's a miracle because the natural circumstances at that time couldn't have allowed that to happen in some way, okay? There wasn't a sudden cold snap where there were ice floats on the Sea of Galilee, and so Jesus and Peter were kind of bounding from one sheet of ice to the next. Uh, the, the guys in the boat didn't jump a bunch of whatever you're supposed to, to put in water on YouTube to make that oobleck stuff that kind of is half solid, half liquid, uh, and so they were kind of waiting on the water. That, that's not what was going on. No, this was something that the natural circumstances, being on water in a boat and, and that in a lake, would never result in someone being able to walk on water. So that's the type of thing that we're talking about when we're talking about miracles. And so the question is, did Jesus actually do these types of things? I would say, yes, he did. And I think that there's at least five good reasons to believe that. And I wanna share those reasons with you right now. Five reasons to believe that Jesus did miracles. The first one is this. 
Jesus' disciples witnessed the miracles, then they wrote about them, and then they stuck with their stories. In John chapter 20, at the end of John's gospel, it says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written down in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John was writing and saying, hey, I've shared these stories of Jesus' miracles, not to, to, uh, to, to cause you to think that could never happen, but he shared them so that you would believe. Eyewitness wrote about what happened to encourage others to believe. Now, you can ask the question, what's your favorite miracle? And in fact, I'd invite you to, to maybe type your favorite miracle story from the Bible in the comments. And what's your favorite miracle that Jesus did? All of Jesus' miracles were witnessed by other people. Sometimes just a handful of people. Sometimes hundreds of people. And on at least a few occasions, thousands of people simultaneously experienced Jesus' miracles. And so when John and Matthew and Mark and Luke and wrote down all of these things that happened, there were all sorts of people that could either confirm or deny the reality of what they were writing. And yet John, who probably wrote his gospel the latest, still at the end of it said, hey, I've written these things down so that you can believe. And by the time John wrote this down, he was in exile for his belief in these things. Many of the other disciples had begun to be persecuted and even martyred for their faith, and they all stuck with their stories. Even though they were losing their life, and even though, if they were false, people could come and confront them and say, what are you doing? But they witnessed them, they wrote them down, and they stuck with their stories. That's the first reason why I think it's really credible, and it's a good idea to believe that Jesus did, in fact, do miracles. The second reason is that the disappointed didn't question the miracles. The disappointed, well, who in the world am I talking about? Well, some people got really excited about Jesus, but then became disappointed or disenfranchised with him. One of the most famous accounts of this involves one of Jesus' greatest miracles or most famous miracles, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, people had come to know Jesus as a, as a miracle worker, as someone that, that was great to listen to, an interesting teacher. He was developing quite a, a following. We would even maybe say today he was becoming sort of a, a celebrity in a sense uh, in those days. And so on one occasion, thousands of people flocked to be with Jesus. And they were out in a little bit more remote place where all these people could gather. And there were 5,000 men, which then probably means with women and children, there may have been 10,000 people or more. There was a ton of people that were there to listen to Jesus. And they, they go through this long day of listening to Jesus, of interacting, and we don't know what all happened that day, but, but somewhere along the line, everybody, the disciples start to realize, we're going to have to feed these people. Now, Jesus knew this all along, and he intended this to teach a lesson. And, and all that they could find in this big group, everybody else had eaten their snacks and had their lunch and all, they, they didn't have any food except one boy had five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus miraculously multiplied that small little meal into enough to feed 5,000 plus people with 12 full baskets of leftovers after the fact. They had as much as they wanted to eat. After this event, the disciples left that night and took a boat across to the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the, the, the lake or that small sea. Jesus in another miracle, joins them. Uh, we, won't, we won't go into that, but, but they're both then gone. Everyone's gone, the disciples and Jesus, to the other side of the lake the next day. The people there that had gotten the food yesterday wake up and say, where'd Jesus and the disciples go? So they follow and they come to Capernaum, the city where they were at, and they wanted another meal. 
this is a good deal. We can listen to Jesus. He might do a miracle. We get free food. And that's kind of where we pick up the story in John chapter 6. It says, when they found them on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. Not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. They weren't even necessarily interested in miracles or, or what Jesus was, they just wanted food. And Jesus goes on and says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. So the people engaged, and Jesus spends the, the rest of that, that chapter kind of explaining more and more of what they meant. Maybe initially the crowd was like, okay, that doesn't seem too hard. We can do that and keep getting food. Jesus makes it very clear in the following verses. No, no, no. I'm not going to keep giving you free lunch. What I'm calling you to do is a life of full commitment to me. It involves sacrifice of your personal desires. It involves submitting your will to God the Father's will. Uh, it, it involves believing all of these things about me. This is how the people at the end responded. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? They're like, I don't think I'm in there. If this isn't just free food, I, I, I'm out. And it says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer with him. And the reason here that why this is a reason for belief is, the disappointed didn't doubt his miracles. They didn't come to the end of this teaching and say, you know what, Jesus, actually, I think you really tricked us. And we're even hungrier than before because we didn't really get food. Somehow you hypnotized us or did something and, and that you didn't provide us food. No, no, they got to the end and they said, bummer. <laughs> I was hoping he'd just kind of keep doing those miracles and, and we could have free food. And they left, not because of disappointment, with Jesus not being able to do the miracles or, or thinking he didn't do it originally, they left because they didn't really want to be fully committed to him. So that's the second reason. The third reason is that his enemies didn't accuse him of hoaxes. His enemies didn't accuse him of hoaxes. There were many established religious leaders at the time of Jesus, chief priests and Pharisees and all these people that kind of had built their identity at, as what they thought was doing the right thing of, of leading people in a religious sense. Unfortunately, instead of rejoicing when Jesus came, they got threatened and wanted to move him off the scene. And they tried all sorts of things to try to minimal, minimalize or marginalize Jesus. They, they accused him of, a tribute, of working in Satan's power rather than God's. They accused him of blasphemy. They accused him of any number of things to try to get the people not to follow him. But interestingly, the one thing that they never really did was try to dissuade people that, that Jesus actually did these miracles because they really couldn't argue with what had happened. One of the most famous examples of, of where this happened and, and the, the religious leaders getting upset about it is when Jesus rose his friend Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha. This little family was, was, seems to be a, a key support system for Jesus and his disciples during their ministry. They, they welcomed them into their home. They probably supported them financially. And, and Lazarus, at some point during Jesus' ministry, got sick really sick. And Mary and Martha knew their friend Jesus can kind of help with these types of things, so they sent word to him. Jesus, interestingly, chooses not to go knowing that his friend Lazarus is going to die because it's going to bring more glory to the Father. Four days later, Jesus shows up, and sure enough, Lazarus has been dead for a considerable amount of time. Mary and Martha are distraught because of this. Uh, they, Jesus tells them to open up the tomb because Lazarus is going to come out alive and people are worried that he's going to stink 
that they do. They shouldn't open the tomb. Lazarus is miraculously restored to life at Jesus' command for him to come out of the tomb. People celebrate and mourning turns into joy and, and lots of people are coming to belief. The religious leaders, though, weren't having it. And let's see what their strategy for dealing with this was, for more people coming to faith in Jesus because of this miracle. In John chapter 11, at the end of the chapter, it says, From that day on, when they were rejoicing over Lazarus' resurrection, they made plans to put him, there speaking of Jesus, to death. And then a little bit later in chapter 12, when the large crowds of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So here we see the enemies of Jesus, those that wanted him gone. They couldn't argue with the reality of the miracle. They didn't try to say it was a hoax. What they tried to do instead was like, I guess all we can do is kill him. And it speaks to the power and the reality and the validity of Jesus' miracles. So that's the third reason. That, that even his enemies didn't accuse him of hoaxes. The fourth reason is that ancient literature acknowledges Jesus' miraculous works. Did you know that the Bible is not the only book of the Bible or the only works of ancient literature that refer to Jesus and his miraculous works? An ancient historian by the name of Josephus, speaking of Jesus in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews, writes about Jesus. And this is how he describes Jesus. He says, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, and it goes on and it talks more about Jesus, the trial and the death and, and different things of Jesus. But the, the important part is here, here is a person with, without really a dog in the fight, acknowledging the fact that Jesus was a doer of wonderful works. And by that, he doesn't just mean Jesus was a really nice guy. He's saying, no, he was known to be able to do something in a supernatural, non-characteristic sort of way, to do miracles, wonderful works. Remember those people in Lazarus' story that, that were the religious leaders? Some of them were in part of a, of a several hundred year project of writing the oral law, and it became known as the Talmud. They believed, and people still believe today, that it's kind of the oral law that God must have given to Moses at the giving of the Ten Commandments, because it helps us understand, they think, the Old Testament law. That's where a lot of the fighting between the religious leaders and Jesus comes in, because they were really committed to the oral law, maybe even more so than the actual law. Not Jesus' friends, right? Those same people acknowledged that Jesus did miracles. In the Talmud, it says it this way, on Passover Eve, they hanged Yeshua, that's the Hebrew way of saying Jesus, of Nazareth. He practiced sorcery, incited, and led Israel astray. Now, we probably wouldn't accept, expect this to be a glowing recommendation of Jesus. And in fact, that's what we get here. He practiced sorcery. Okay, They weren't fans, but they knew something was going on. And sorcery or magic, they talk about in some other references that make similar statements in the Talmud and different other places. We're not talking here about like the nice America's Got Talent magic. No, they, they were talking here like sorcery, like Lord of the Rings, Saruman and Sauron and, and crazy stuff happening that, that has no explanation. So even they acknowledge that Jesus did these types of things. The last reason that I think is why it makes it credible to believe that Jesus actually did miracles is that Jesus's miracle stories are different than ancient myths. Uh, 
I'm reading through the Iliad right now uh, again, and it's filled with all sorts of fantastic and interesting stories of the gods and how they interacted with mankind and, and all of this stuff from Greek mythology. A lot of it's not appropriate to talk in this setting, so don't worry, parents. You don't need to cover your parents' ears. But they, they or your kids' ears. So they had these, these crazy stories. So one of the stories, like, the gods made Achilles a set of armor and delivered it to him right as he was going into battle finally with Troy. Is, are these stories just the same? Is, are the miracle stories just the same as those type of myths of, of ancient literature? I would say no, they're not. They're of a different character. One, they, they have a, a, a bigger f flavor of reality. Real places, real situations, with real people by name that, that were there. And then two, contrary to like the Iliad and that, that, that were told orally and developed over hundreds of years, they were written down and told while people were still alive. And so once again, people could come in and confirm or deny these type of events. And so they, they are not of the same character, either the way that they're told or the fact that they could be confirmed or denied. So these are just some of the reasons why I think the answer to the question, did Jesus do miracles, needs to be and should be and has to be yes. Yes, he did do miracles. Now the purpose of all of these miracles being in the Bible, it's certainly to demonstrate that Jesus was God. But it's also there for us to be encouraged by them. If all we did with these miracle stories and these things that we're learning in the Prove It series was to just try to intellectually strong arm people into belief in Christianity, we've kind of missed the whole point. You know, we can take what Pastor Josh said last week about Jesus fulfilling prophecy and therefore being God and, and who the Bible really says it in. And then you can say, all right, I'm, I bought into Pastor Scott's five reasons that are solid, Okay, so now my next door neighbor, he's got to believe because I'm just going to make him. This could be part of that conversation for many people. But, but really, God is more concerned about what are the spiritual truths that are being communicated in these stories? What is the encouragement that people can find and should find in these stories, especially in crazy times that we're in right now? So I want to spend just a few moments working through and thinking about what are the encouraging truths that are related to Jesus' miracles. Now, I had lots of fun trying to think about which encouraging truths I wanted to consider because there's dozens of miracle stories and they're all capture your imagination. My kids, when we read the Bible, you know, when we get to the miracle, they're like the top ones. They're the best things. So how do you limit? I'm going to share three truths with you tonight or today. The first one is this. Every miracle points to the gospel. Every miracle points to the gospel. And I'm indebted to a man by the name of Lee Irons. He said it this way. We need to recognize that each miracle points to Christ's atoning death and resurrection. He delivered a sermon and then wrote a blog post and I stumbled upon it in my reading and it got me thinking and I thought, oh man, that's really true. And what he means by that, and what has been encouraging my soul this week, is this. All of the miracles help us understand the gospel's impact on our life. Let's start with one that's maybe a, a, a little easier because of our familiarity, because of a, of a famous hymn. Jesus healed blind people. He gave them sight. The hymn writer would say, I once was blind, but now I see. It's a reality that that miracle helps us understand what it means to go from spiritual blindness to spiritual sight. Let's think about another miracle. Uh, calming the storms on the sea. Uh, it highlights, one, metaphorically, our lives might be a turmoil and, and unrest, and when we come to know Jesus, we can have peace immediately. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in a, in a real sense, the Bible tells us, like in Romans, all creation is groaning. 
Sin doesn't just mess up things for us personally. It messes up everything in our world. The coronavirus would be a big example of this. Things get messed up all over the place. And the story of Jesus calming the waters of the sea with just his word is a great example that, that his work, his gospel work, is what fixes not just our personal sin problem, but all the effects of sin in all of creation. And we can look forward to a day, because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we can have a perfect existence in a perfect creation that points to the good news of the gospel. We talked about the feeding of the 5,000 earlier. We could think about a miracle like Jesus turning water into wine, and you could say about all of the goodness that comes, the provision, how our needs are cared for through Jesus Christ. Yes, he cares for us as long as our lives last, but he gives us a phenomenal experience with him forever where our every need is cared for and we get to experience that with him in a perfect creation forever. I could go on and on, but all of the different miracles point and help us understand just a little bit more of what the good news about the gospel is. Now we've kind of touched on this just a little bit at various points, but I wanna be crystal clear about the gospel. We, you've heard things about like you need to believe in his name. We, we've, we've made a couple of references here. The quote on the screen talked about Christ's atoning death and his resurrection. Here is the good news of the gospel. God designed everything perfectly. There wasn't any problem with our relationship with him, our relationship with one another, and our relationship with creation. God said there's only one rule to the original humans, Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, you can't eat the, the fruit from one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve went ahead and did that. They stepped away from God's design. And it broke their relationship with one another. It broke their relationship with God. And it broke their relationship with creation. And ever since then, every one of us has taken steps away from God's perfect design. God calls whenever we make those steps away from his design, he calls that sin. And what happens then when we sin, we know it, we're not content with it, like we know life, and so then we start pursuing things to fix it. So we might look to other relationships, we might look to, to our beverage or food of choice, we might look to, to just working really hard and forgiving about it. We might look to vegging out with Netflix or whatever the case may be. But the problem is all of those things take us further and further away from God's design. And God knew this and he wants us to live according to his design. So he provided a way to step in. And that's where Jesus comes in. He sent Jesus to the world. Jesus lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He always did what was right. And yet he was still killed. And that atoning sacrifice, that's what it's talking about. He died taking the place for our sin. He paying the penalty for our sin through his death on the cross. Because he was God, it has infinite worth. And then he rose from the grave saying that he has victory over death and sin. And that we can have life with God forever. And the Bible says that when we repent and believe when we turn from pursuing our own ways to try to fix the brokenness in our world and we believe in God's design for fixing that through Jesus Christ we can have life with him forever and I would invite you you can experience that right now in this moment if you have not yet done that and you can just say in your heart or even out loud a simple prayer like this that says God I know I'm a sinner I know that I've walked away for your perfect design from my life. And I believe that Jesus pays the penalty for my sin, that through him I can have forgiveness, and that in his resurrection I can have life eternal with you. And I'm trusting in that, instead of all the other things, to give me life with you. And if you believe that in your heart and, and confess that with your mouth, the Bible says that you are now one of God's children and you have life with him. If that happens to be the case for you, we would love to hear from it. We've got a response card on our website. It's probably linked in the feed of this broadcast as well. 
but, but I invite you to go there. And right at the top of the page, there's a couple of options. One says, today I decided to follow Jesus. If you just prayed that prayer or in the last week said something similar to God, we'd love to hear about it. And we would love to rejoice with you. Maybe you're saying, this sounds interesting. I'm not quite sure if I'm there yet, Scott. There's another one there that says, I've got some questions. And it, it just kind of explains this. There's a little video from another one of our pastors and the verses and different things that you can take a look at it and begin to process it. But we would invite you to believe and to do that. If you have already made this decision, uh, here's an action step for you this week in light of this first encouraging truth of everything, all the miracles helping us understand uh, the gospel a little bit more. So here, read a gospel, and by this I mean one of the books of the Bible, uh, the, the good news about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and to think about how each miracle in that gospel highlights the good news about Jesus. And then maybe write it down and share it with somebody. Maybe you could share it with your family devotions or with your spouse. Maybe if you're getting onto an online meeting with your group or with a, a smaller group of other believers, or maybe even somebody that's not yet a believer, your neighbor, and you could share how you're encouraged with the good news about Jesus. So that's the first one. Every miracle points us to helping us to know uh, more about the gospel. The second is that Jesus can heal at a distance. Uh, this has been super encouraging for me as I have worked through this in, in the last, and it, it's, I was reminded of it because my family is reading with our kids the Gospel of John at night. And in, in John chapter 4, uh, it tells a story here of another miracle of Jesus. And it says there, And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. You can imagine a dad at its last option here. And, and Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, Sir, Come down before my child dies. I don't know what you're saying. I need help for my son. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when they began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. So here's this great story that Jesus heals this man's son. He enters into the sorrow of this father and he fixes the brokenness that their family was experiencing. And where did he do it from? Miles away. He wasn't physically present with the son. Jesus has ascended into heaven. He is not physically present here on earth. But we can take heart that Jesus can heal even at a distance. He is able to do it. And so the, the next step, the action step for this point is this, that, that we would pray that Jesus will stop the COVID-19 virus. I'm praying this every day. I would love to wake up tomorrow and have that scenario that I painted at the, the picture be true. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but we can keep praying. We can keep asking. We can keep begging that, that God would do this. Now, it, that does bring up a question, and we are going to talk about it. If Jesus can heal at a distance, why doesn't he? It's a little bit of a bigger rabbit trail than we have time to investigate today. So I want to invite you to join me and Pastor Josh on Facebook Live tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. And we'll kind of work through this a little bit more um, of the answer to that question. I don't know if Jesus is going to miraculously heal individuals or miraculously heal the world from COVID-19 all at once. I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know that he wants us to pray for it. And I do know that we can believe that it happens. And I do know that he has the ability to do it if he would choose. The last reason that I, that I find encouragement in the miracle stories of Jesus is this, that Jesus' victory over death gives us peace. When my daughter found out I was 
teaching on miracles, I had to include this story. It has always been her favorite story in the Bible. And it's the story of a little girl who is very sick. And her parents come, her dad comes and, and, and tries to find Jesus and invites Jesus to come and, and to heal or, or to be with his little girl. And Jesus agrees to come. And along the way, another lady reaches out and touches Jesus for healing and happens. And so he stops and he has a conversation with her and he, there's crowds and it's taking longer and, and that. And, and he can't get there. And then the father, somebody else from the household comes and he gets the worst news that I can imagine getting as a father. And that's where we pick up the story here in Luke chapter 8. It says, while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus on hearing this answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they all laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given to her to eat. Jesus' victory over death gives us peace. This father, after receiving the worst news that a father could receive, that his little girl had died, Jesus says, don't be afraid, only believe. And what this story begins to highlight for us, and really all of this stories where Jesus brings people back to life, point us to is what his resurrection does. The greatest miracle of Jesus is that he himself came back to life after being dead for five, for three days. Luke tells the story in his gospel this way. They're, they're beginning to understand this. The women go to the grave. It's empty. So then they go back and they tell the disciples, Peter runs ahead. He has to see for himself. The grave is empty. Then he goes back. They don't know what's going on. Meanwhile, in Luke's account, Two guys are walking home to their home in Emmaus from Jerusalem, followers of Jesus. Emmaus, we could think of as kind of like a suburb of Jerusalem. They're walking home, and this guy shows up and starts walking with them, and it's Jesus. But, but somehow they're not able to recognize who it is. And, and they walk, and Jesus begins to explain to them from the Old Testament how they shouldn't have been surprised, like this was part of God's plan all along. They get to the house, they invite this guy, they're having a such good conversation, they invite him in, he keeps talking, and they share dinner together. And as they're breaking bread together, the lights come on and they realize, this is Jesus. And then immediately he vanishes. Those guys then go back to the disciples and they just add to the confusion. They're all together together. They have no idea what's coming on. They're getting stories from all over the place of different information. It's kind of like when this COVID stuff came out and you're looking at your Facebook feed and all the different news and you're, what is real, what's not, how do we deal with this? That's kind of where they're at. They're confused. They're scared. They're hurting. They're hopeful. They don't know what's going on. What does Jesus do? He shows up. And what's the first thing that he says? As they were talking about these things, guys from Emmaus have just come back and telling them, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And when he said to them, and he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see me, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved, for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Jesus wanted to make sure he was, they knew he was really back. Touch me. Let's eat together. Let's experience this together. And his presence was meant to give them peace. 
If I could imagine, if I could kind of combine these stories, I would say Jesus would say something like us, like this to us today in the midst of this COVID uh, craziness. Peace to you. Do not fear. Only believe. I don't know if tomorrow is going to be better or worse. I don't know if things are going to get more restrictive. But I do know that because of Jesus' resurrection, and because of the promise of the, resurrection, of the resurrection that believers have when we follow him, even if the worst happens, we get to spend eternity with Jesus. And that's a great truth. I would invite you to participate as you're able in the morning prayers that Alex and Alex are recording and doing. They get on at 6 in the morning. God bless them. I usually jump on a little bit later and, and listen, and that, that's fine. That's the whole design of it. But it's a way to just keep reminding of ourselves of the peace that's available through Jesus Christ by starting our day by talking with him. Hey, this Prove It series is not just a chance to get smarter about what the Bible teaches us. There are great encouraging truths. We can be encouraged by remembering all the different facets of the gospel that are presented in the miracles. We can remember that Jesus can, and he might, heal at a, diff at a distance. And then we can be reminded that we can have peace because of Jesus' victory over death. And he showed us that in his resurrection. I want to pray with you and for you, and then I invite you as our worship experience continues to fill out the response card and let us know how you're processing these things as we experience them together. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this chance to connect together. I thank you that Jesus did miracles, and I thank you that it's not just something that makes us smarter or, or, or better to pound people into belief, but that you have encouragement for us because of who Jesus is. Help us to live confidently. Help us to live peacefully. Help us to communicate those things with hope to the world around us. In his name that we pray.